Hello. Welcome to Prophecy Pod Radio. Today I'm going to continue my series on apologetics, uh, specifically how we got our Bible. Now, most of this information can be found at GodandScience.org and also in Josh McDowell's book, The New Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And you will also find similar information at Lee Strobel's website and in numerous other apologetics resources. Now, the New Testament autographs were written between 45 to 95 AD. And although most scholars believe the New Testament was originally written in Greek, there are other scholars who claim the Aramaic Peshitta came first, and there is uh, strong textual evidence that this may be the case. Uh, there are also scholars who believe that Matthew was originally written in Hebrew. Uh, the letters of Paul, known as the Pauline Epistles, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, and the Book of Acts are all dated from 45 to 63 AD. The Gospel of John and the Revelation may have been written as late as 95 AD, but these are all first century books. They did not come uh, long after the facts. Now currently there are, there are over 5600 early Greek manuscripts of the New Testament still in existence that we know about. The oldest of these manuscripts were written on papyrus, and the later manuscripts were written on leather uh, called parchment. The New Testament manuscripts, which date most closely to the original autograph, um, was copied around 125 AD within 35 years of the original. And that's very important, as we'll discuss later. It is designated P52 and contains a small portion of John 18, and the P uh, stands for papyrus. Now from around 200 AD we have Bodmer P66, a papyrus manuscript of course, and it contains a large portion of the Gospel of John. The Chester Beatty Biblical Papyrus P46 from around 200 AD contains the Pauline Epistles in Hebrews. Uh, from 225 AD, Bodmer Papyrus P75, from around 225 AD, as I said, contains the Gospels of Luke and John. Now, Chester Beatty Biblical Papyrus P45, um, from around 250 to 300 AD, contains portions of the four Gospels and Acts. The Codex Sinaiticus from 350 AD contains the entire New Testament and almost the entire Old Testament in Greek. It was discovered at an Orthodox monastery on Mount Sinai in 1856 by a German scholar named Tizendorf. Now, the Codex Vatican, uh, Vaticanus B, also from 350 AD, is an almost complete New Testament, and it is cataloged as being in the Vatican, uh, the Vatican Library, since 1475. And that was the Codex Vaticanus. Now, traditional scholars believe the translations of the New Testament from Greek into Latin, Syriac, and Coptic versions began around 180 AD. But as I mentioned earlier, there are those who believe in the primacy of the Arama Aramaic Peshitta, and they would claim that the Greek texts are translations of an even earlier Aramaic text. Um, now, the name of the first translation from around 195 AD of the Old and New Testaments into Latin was termed Old Latin. Both of those testaments were translated from the Greek. Backing this up are quotes from Tertullian, an early church father who lived around 160 to 220 AD in North Africa, and he was a writer and a theologian, and as I said, he quotes from the Old Latin. The Old Syriac was a translation of the New Testament from the Greek into Syriac around 300 AD. And also from 300 AD we have the Coptic versions. Coptic was spoken in Egypt in four different dialects and the Bible was translated into each of these four dialects. In 380 AD the Latin Vulgate was translated by Saint Jerome and he, tr he translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Latin and he translated the Greek New Testament into Latin as well. And the Latin Vulgate Bible was used by the Western Church until the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, and it is still the authoritative translation for the Roman Catholic Church. However, because of the Protestant Reformation, 
There were numerous translations of the Bible into different languages, giving many people access to God's Word in their own language. And of course, these people did not have access to the Bible before the Protestant Reformation. Now, some of those early translations of the Bible were in Armenian, Georgian, and Ethiopic, um, Ethiopic Slavic, and Gothic. The first English translation of the Bible was by John Wycliffe in 1380 AD and he translated the Bible into English from the Latin Vulgate and this was a translation from a translation and of course it was not a translation from the original Hebrew uh, or Greek and he did that because uh, he didn't know Hebrew or Greek now with the advent of the printing press Bibles became more available and in 1456 Gutenberg produced the first printed Bible in Latin and naturally printing revolutionized the way books were made and after the printing press was invented books could be published in great numbers and at much lower cost making the Bible more accessible now in 1514 uh, the Greek New Testament was printed for the first time by Erasmus. He based his Greek New Testament from uh, only five Greek manuscripts, and the oldest of which dated uh, as far back as the 12th century, with minor revisions. Uh, now, Erasmus made minor revisions, uh, and the Greek New Testament came to be known as the Textus Receptus, uh, Textus Receptus, or the Received Text. In 1522, polyglot, uh, the Polyglot Bible was published, and the Old Testament uh, was in Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin, and the New Testament in Latin and Greek. Erasmus used the Polyglot to revise later editions of his New Testament. Tyndale made use of the Polyglot in his translations on the Old Testament into English, which he did... Uh, uh, actually, he didn't complete because he was martyred in 1534. In 1611, the King James Version into English from the original Hebrew and Greek was made. The King James translators of the New Testament used the Textus Receptus as the basis for their translations. And in my lifetime, many more translations have been made. There is the United Bible Society's fourth edition of the Greek New Testament, and that's from 1968. This Greek New Testament made use of the oldest Greek manuscripts, which date from 175 AD. And this was the Greek New Testament text from which the NASV and the NIV were translated. In 1971, the American Standard Version was published, and it makes use of much older Hebrew and Greek manuscripts now available that weren't available at the time of the translation of the King James Version. Uh, its wording and sentence structure uh, closely follow the Greek in more of a word-for-word -word style. In 1973, I'm sorry, 1983, the new inter international version was published, and it also made use of the oldest manuscript evidence, and it is more of a thought-for-thought for translation, and it reads a little, it reads much easier than the NASV. Uh, there are other translations as well, such as the ESV or the English Standard Version, uh, which is, th and then there is the ASV, which is the American Standard Version, and, and there are other other versions as well. Now, as you can see, we have quite a bit of manuscript evidence for the New Testament, and we have many translations to choose from. And because we have so many manuscripts and quotations also from early church fathers, uh, we could, uh, as a matter of fact, we could recreate almost the entire New Testament just from the letters that the early church fathers wrote and their quotations from the New Testament. So we can know that what was originally written down has been reliably passed on. And we can trust our New Testament despite what skeptics might say. Now that's all I have time for today. In my next lesson I will discuss some of the Bible difficulties and some of the apparent Bible contradictions. And until then I'd like to thank you for listening to Prophecy Pod Radio and I hope you will join me next time.